Welcome to Purple Daily. Matthew Collar, former NFL quarterback Sage Rosenfels. And yes, everyone, we have a move to start out the show with. The Minnesota Vikings have a receiver. They have signed Tajay Sharp. And uh, Ian Rappaport of NFL Network immediately got ratioed uh, by saying that he is the replacement for Stefan Diggs. I don't think he's exactly filling the void, as Ian put it on Twitter. But, uh, Sage, the Vikings at least creating some competition by signing the best remaining receiver on the market. Yeah, they need receivers. They need competition. I believe they're not done. I, I got to think they're going to draft somebody. And I think draft somebody fairly high uh, because they really do need uh, a, a top flight other receiver, in my opinion. So uh, I think they've got their third and fourth guy, or maybe they see B.C. Johnson as maybe if they see B.C. Johnson as their second guy, I have concerns. And I like B.C. I just don't see the the physical talent, the guy that really scares the defense. Uh, uh, and I think you need that at that position. We need somebody that can really fly. This kid's not that fast. He's a four five five guy. Although he's got very small hands. Uh, I looked up at some of his combine numbers. He's a four five five guy, and he's got like eight and three eight inch, hand, uh, inch hands or something like that. Anyway, um, and he, uh, if you look back at his stats, you know his rookie year, he was targeted eighty some times, eighty plus times. That's a lot. Eighty three times as a rookie, but he mm -hmm. only had forty one catches. So got a lot of action early, uh, played in a lot of games the last couple of years and didn't, didn't play uh, and have as many starts in 2019. He only had six starts uh, of his 13, uh, 15 games that he played. So uh, his numbers have sort of gone down each year of the last three years. And so obviously the Vikings getting a discount. They probably like that potential they saw, though, in year one. Again, maybe that's what Spielman saw or, or uh, George Payton or Gary Kubiak a couple of years ago when they played them. They saw a kid uh, that obviously was getting a lot of action as a young guy, and hopefully he can return to some of that form. Yeah, and he is not really any type of deep threat, as you mentioned. He only ran a 4.55, uh, which for someone under 200 pounds at the Combine is really unimpressive. And he has not been a deep threat whatsoever in the NFL. His longest catch last year was only 20 yards. He only had 25 receptions last year. So it is a shot at somebody who maybe with more opportunity could put up better numbers, but he is not anywhere in the near of the ballpark of Stefan Diggs or any type of replacement. This isn't like you brought in like one of the trades that we were talking about or that I wrote about. I don't think we got to it the other day, but uh, trading for Brandon Cooks would have been an idea where you could fill a spot of a Stefan Diggs and a move like this sage with somebody who had put up better numbers in the past and then fell off a little bit and is still fairly young would have been, I think, good if we were taking the long view, because maybe he works out better than you think he's going to. And he becomes a 60 catch receiver and he's very solid. But in terms of filling needs right away and trying to be good for 2020, I don't see this as doing a whole lot. It sort of reminds me of other moves that they've made with receivers that were down like Kendall Wright or Tavares King or Michael Floyd. I mean, this guy might be because he's younger, more on the rise, but it doesn't look like it from his numbers. And he had a couple of good games, but overall, you know, not a guy who was a major contributor to the Tennessee Titans offense really at any point. I would like it taking a shot to see if he works out, but if you're trying to be good next year because you signed Kirk Cousins to a contract extension, then this doesn't change the formula a whole heck of a lot. It doesn't, and, and he'll know this offense very, fairly well. That Tennessee offense is very similar uh, uh, to Gary Kubiak's offense in a lot of different ways, and so he will come and have some, some that experience, and, 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 uh, and he has played a lot of football games, but I do think it fills a need. I think the need is the fourth receiver. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or maybe the third receiver or something like that. I don't think it feel, fills that need. I don't think so. Uh, but again, I'm not watching them on film and, and grading all these guys uh, uh, like the Vikings are doing, but I don't see him as the number two guy. I see that's probably going to have to come through the draft um, or, you know, they're going to have a, an interesting offense with a lot of tight ends next year. So I was looking at the uh, wide receivers from last year, rookies and who made an impact and whether you can count on somebody who is a rookie to step right in. And of course, again, there's no filling the shoes of a 27-year-old veteran top 15 wide receiver in the NFL like Stefan Diggs is. 
So there's no just, yeah, plug him in. He'll be fine. The top rookie receiver last year had 59 catches, and that was Deontay Johnson from Pittsburgh, and he wasn't super efficient in doing so. And then Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, Debo Samuel, A.J. Brown, and Hunter Renfro, all guys you've heard of, were all in the 49 to 58 range. McLaurin and A.J. Brown were legitimately great last year, like top-notch wide receivers, home run draft picks for Washington and for Tennessee. But out of all of the draft picks who were taken, uh, let's see, I got 39, 40 that got into games and got some type of targets. We only had one, two, three, four, five that were over 50 receptions last season. So tell me this, though, Sage. Is it difficult for a rookie wide receiver to step into a Gary Kubiak offense? Because you have talked in the past about how he makes everybody around him better. Uh, he is great with the tight ends and the offensive linemen become better when they step into the Kubiak offense. How does that impact receivers? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, everyone's going to be impacted. Let's just start off with, I mean, I don't see, uh, I'm, I'm, we'll see how the OTA thing works out and how many there are and when that is, if there is OTAs, right? So starting Doesn't off, seem I'm, likely. I'm starting off, I'm concerned about any rookie playing you know, right off the bat uh, a lot. I mean, any offense takes time to learn. It's not just Gary's offense, but every single offense does take time. Uh, and they're, and it seems like receivers are they're lost early, like in OTAs, but then as you get into training camp or, or late OTAs, like they can line up and play with, you know, the other guys. They don't have to be, uh, you know, sort of coddled uh, and constantly, you know, have the wide receiver coach, like, you know, showing them where a split has to be and, and those types of things. They, it, it's very learnable. But if you don't have the off-season work now, that puts it to training camp, mm -hmm. and that means you know a few weeks before the season he'll start to have a decent feel for the offense, and that's a little bit concerning. Yeah, and it was disastrous for most of training camp for the rookie receivers last year. Mike Zimmer at one point called them out and said, "You guys better figure out where to line up because otherwise none of you are making the team." And eventually, like you said, a couple weeks before the season, BC Johnson emerged and he had a good year, but he's not a guy that you're thinking he's going to explode and become the next digs by the well, way B, well bc's one of his best strengths is that he can line up and he does all the right things and yeah. runs the right routes you know you don't tag every single player if i just say why bingo cross that tells four five guys what to do all right so you know if you got the side of the bingo you got the post if you're on the opposite side, you got the shallow you know blah 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 and uh that does take time and, and sometimes guys play early or they just are guys that play because they just can pick things up faster and they don't, you know, they're, they're that's just the way their mind works or maybe it helped them that they had a similar sort of, you know, concept in college and, and, and that transition can, can just be challenging. So that is one of the main reasons that, you know, BC did not make a lot of mistakes last year. And, and, you know, before you can actually go out there and make plays, usually you have to line up right and run the right routes. And I think he does a good job of that. So to get a sense for how the rest of the NFL felt about Tajay Sharp, he will make $1 million for the Minnesota Vikings in 2020. So we saw other receivers like Bashad Perriman is going to make $8 bucks. Robbie Anderson, I think, was two years for 20. And those numbers were just too high for the Vikings to match. Even Philip Dorsett earned a decent contract, and they get Tajay Sharp for a million bucks. So when you're signing someone at that price, you should kind of expect to get what you paid for. And my expectations for him are not super high and I think you're exactly right that they're going to have to rely on a rookie to step in and the other guy that they're going to have to really focus on this year Sage I think is Irv Smith I think this all puts a lot of pressure on Irv Smith to take a huge step forward which I think he has a chance to do and I really liked what I saw from him in year one but in the Kubiak offense I think you're using two tight ends a lot and Smith has to be more of a downfield weapon than he was last year yeah, he he will be more of this offense again. You know, just like any, just as I was saying earlier about wide receivers, you know, in particular tight end because tight end you really you have to understand running game, you have to understand protections and techniques, and he really did a nice job of of getting in there. Uh, he was the number two guy and slowly worked to where you know he was uh, a, a real threat for this football team and, and part of this offense. And so you know he doesn't have that. Uh, that little window there that he has that learning time and he'll be right into it. So I, I'd like to think in particular now more than ever, I don't know about pressure, but maybe more responsibility for Irv Smith this year 
uh, that that you know I think Kubiak will try to find ways, whether it's formations or whatever. You know, I'm interested to see if then he can take that next step where he's you know working some receiver type routes. Like, yeah. can he do that? Can he be one of those guys that you put on the outside and you can run a slant or a sluggo or you get a matchup on a short safety or something like that, or even a linebacker? you feel good about, you know, I, I do not know that, but usually this is the off season, the second, the third year where they, they start to see if those, uh, those tight ends can do some of the things on the outside, because there's just not enough time. A lot of times in the rookie year, you're just working on those, you know, outside running schemes and, and again, pass protection. And you're doing all those things, much less worrying about it. You know, can the guy run a sluggo route or not? Mm-hmm. Usually that, that takes a few years in the NFL. So I, I think it also shows us that, it's going to be all about Adam Thielen and whether he can handle the entire load here. Because, I hope he stays healthy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because right, last year he was hurt and other times where Diggs was out, teams found ways to take him away in the past. Yeah, well, he's not a, a burner and he's not a massive, he's not Randy Moss, you know, who's you know six, five and crazy long. And, and you just had to dull team all the time. He's not that guy. He does a great job at winning one-on-one routes but a lot of times and he makes great catches in traffic or you know in those 50 50 balls but one of the reasons is he doesn't always get crazy separation he has just unbelievable pass catching skills to go up and just take the ball away from people so he's a good he's a really really good player but you know he just doesn't freak teams out of like oh we have to play two receivers over here we have to double him all the time and to be honest with you they might double him a lot more uh, if they don't, the Vikings don't have a threat on the other side. Yeah. And I wonder if this means he is more as an outside receiver and we see BC Johnson and Tajay Sharp play the inside, or if they draft a receiver, I think it's hard for a rookie to play in the slot if they haven't done that before. Um, So we'll see how they work it out or if there's more moves coming.